My name is Tessa Boykane, I'm the Deputy CEO of the Australian Council of Social Service and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this uh, set to briefing around the charity and not for profit reforms that are currently underway. The range of reforms and the implications of those reforms are all areas of work that I think parts of the sector have been working on for a very long time. But I'm not sure we necessarily would have anticipated them coming in the way they come, with the timing that they come, and the sequencing that they come. And with the amount of pressure that they in turn produced for the sector to be across and responding to those areas of reform. ACOS has a very long history of working in this area of policy around how we support and sustain an effective community sector. But we've been incredibly conscious as we've undertaken that work that maintaining the sector's engagement and understanding of what's underway is a really critical part of the work that we need to do. Of course, we're not always resourced to do the kind of briefing and the kind of work with our own members, let alone the much broader parts of the not-for-profit sector that we would like to do and that we see as important to ensure that level of engagement across the sector. And so to that end, we are incredibly grateful and I think very respectful of NAB's recognition that this kind of work, that the resourcing of community organisations and charities to come together to have briefings and even caucusing discussions around these issues is a really critical role that an organisation like NAB can play. So I'd like to acknowledge NAB's support at this event. I'd like to thank in particular the work of Kirsty Jennings and her team, including Nicola Carter, who've done all of the logistics, the provision of this very welcoming space and the communication to make sure that people were aware of this event. And I'd also like to acknowledge in particular Michael Bedwell and the team from Government Education and Community Business at NAB who sponsored this event and made it possible for us today. The order of proceedings is um, effectively a, a seminar from 9.30 until 12.30. We're going to break it into two sections. So we're going to spend the first part of the morning talking about the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission. And I'm delighted to be able to um, welcome Susan Pascoe, who's the um, interim commissioner and who will take up the mantle as commissioner of the ACNC when it opens its doors. And she'll also be accompanied by Murray Baird, who's her assistant commissioner. And certainly the Melbournians in the room, they're probably both very familiar figures in terms of the work that they've done around charitable. So when they join us, they will be talking about the um, work of the ACNC and its implications for community services once it opens its doors. Beyond the, the nuts and bolts of what the ACNC means for the sector, the purpose of this briefing is really to bring members of the sector up to speed on the origins of this reform, with a particular focus on the ACNC, and also on the work towards a modernised definition of charity. So again, both areas that have a very long history, but I think in terms of the amount of work that's happening sometimes in other areas, very important to remember those issues that are really at the essence of a charitable sector, and why there is this move forward or reforms on both those fronts. We're very conscious that there are a lot of people in the room who have their own expertise on these issues, but also a lot of people in the room for whom this will be a briefing around issues that they might have known were, were happening but didn't necessarily have the details. So we'll make sure that there's time for question and discussion both after Susan's presentation before we break for morning tea. And then after morning tea, we'll move into the second session, which is looking at the reform to modernise the definition of charity. And again, I'm delighted that we're joined by Esther Abrams from Changemakers, who will be able to contribute the work that Changemakers have been doing on this topic. And, um, and I'll be giving you an ACOS perspective on, the again, the history of that reform, but really where it's up to now, so that we can have a, a pretty well-informed discussion about next steps and where that leads mm. the organisations in the sector. So to begin, the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission is scheduled to open on the 1st of October this year. It's based here in Melbourne. It has recruited a, a staff, including some very excellent people from the community sector, but also people with incredibly important knowledge of regulatory bodies and of working across government, the not-for-profit sector and other sectors um, as part of its makeup. So there's, there's quite a lot of exposure to the work of the ACNC at the moment. <coughs> But one of, the, one of the critical issues in terms of the SCNC is the legislation that enables that body, the legislation that is currently before the House of Representatives Economics Committee. In understanding how we've gotten to that legislation, and certainly in understanding some of the issues that I'll raise in a moment, it's really important to remember the origins of this reform. 
So the Productivity Commission study into the contribution of the not-for-profit sector, which was chaired by Robert Fitzgerald and which reported in January 2010, really set the blueprint for a whole range of not-for-profit reforms. It kicked up a long uh, history of advocacy by the sector for a national regulator. ACOS and many other organisations had long called for a focused, consistent regulatory framework that would support the activities of the not-for-profit sector by <coughs> reducing unnecessary duplication, but at the same time ensuring that the regulation that takes place is effective. Our biggest criticism of the regulation to date has always been that while there's a mass of regulatory burden, it doesn't translate into the kind of information that we ought to know about this sector in terms of the industry profile, in terms of organisations knowing where they sit across the landscape of not-for-profits, and in terms of policy makers, both government and non-government, being able to understand the nature of this sector in terms of how it can um, identify and meet social policy needs as well as a whole range of other needs around cultural, sporting and other um, areas of civil society life. <coughs> so the Productivity Commission was very clear in its recommendation that there should be a one-stop shop for Commonwealth regulation by consolidating the various regulatory frameworks across the country into a new national registrar. The Productivity Commission also recommended <coughs> the uh, reform to modernise the definition of charity by adopting a statutory definition of charitable purpose. And it picked up the recommendations that were made in the 2001 inquiry, the Charity Definition Inquiry, and Definitions Inquiry and related organisations. Not surprising it picked that up, Robert Fitzgerald was a member of the 2001 inquiry, but also not surprising it picked that up because those recommendations had also had a very broad level of support across the community sector, across not-for-profits nationally, and had been advocated for very many years <coughs> by um, people both within and outside of government. I frame those two recommendations to um, give us a starting point for the discussion today, but I think it's important to remember that the Productivity Commission study was landmark for a whole range of recommendations that we are still working on and that we are still hoping will, will emerge in other ways down the track. And so important to remember that in addition to the regulator and the reform to modernise the definition of charity, the PC recommended reducing compliance costs and improving effectiveness, a major issue in terms of the capacity of our charities and not-for-profits to do their work well. It recommended establishing a standardised process of measurement and evaluation. It recommended developing a sustainable market for financing of NFP debt, recognising that the capacity to shore up non-government sources of funding for community organisations requires a whole level of engagement with the finance sector that not-for-profits in Australia are very far from at the moment. It recommended clear directions for stimulating innovation in our sector, again, recognising that in order to succeed, sometimes organisations need to be able to fail, but as community services, charities and not-for-profits, there's very little resourcing available to test, to evaluate and to adopt or move away from directions within the sector. And it recommended building sector capabilities to improve governance and enhance productivity. So a whole raft of recommendations. And that context is important because the ones that we focus on now, and as you'll see, the direction that those reforms have taken, are actually a very particular direction away from the kind of discussion that the Productivity Commission was urging us to have about an effective, a sustainable, a viable, not-for-profit sector. Productivity Commission reports in 2010, the federal budget in May 2011 comes, and with it a series of announcements by the federal government, government about its commitments to reforms in the charities and not-for-profit sector. The first commitment was that it would establish the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission as the embodiment of the recommendation for a national regulator. The second commitment was the reform to the use of tax concessions by businesses run by not-for-profits organisations under the guise of ensuring a better targeting of the tax concessions that are available to charities and not-for-profits. Now, um, people in the room might know, the, know about these in terms of UBIT, Unrelated Business Income Tax, or in relation to the In Australia test that has been um, the subject of a lot of policy development. So those reforms come under the rubric of this second reform that the government committed. And the third commitment was to introduce a statutory definition of charity specifically, as the government said, to address current outdated and uncertain definitional issues and to assist the sector through greater consistency. 
In the ACOS submission to the Productivity Commission study, we use that um, piece of work as an opportunity to do a very broad national consultation around the kinds of issues that not-for-profits felt were important and the ways they should be picked up in terms of policy development. On the specific question of a national regulator, we were very clear about the objectives that we saw <coughs> and the outcomes that we would like to um, know were a part of the policy design for a national regulator. <coughs> So these included very clearly and specifically the reduction of red tape and the capacity building for the sector to ensure, as I say, that not only are organisations viable, but that they're effective in their work. Now obviously from an ACOS perspective, where the peak body for charities and not-for-profits working with people experiencing poverty and inequality, so the more time our members spend on reporting burdens and on red tape, the less time they're spending with their clients and the communities who rely on them. But this is a message that cuts across the broad not-for-profit sector. It affects cultural organisations, it affects sporting organisations, it affects the vast range of organisations within the not-for-profit sector who are mission-driven, who have a focus and um, if they're charities, who generally have some form of altruistic purpose. So the, the capacity and the reduction of unnecessary and overly burdensome red tape were really critical factors in the sector's advocacy for this national regulator. We recognise that it should cover the entire scope of the not-for-profit sector. And as I've said, that, that cuts across many types of organisations and many activities. But we also recognise that the levels of regulatory burden and the reporting requirements that those should bring ought to be different, depending on the size, on turnover of staff, on economic significance, on a whole range of issues, including on activity. We were very clear that the sector's capacity to remain diverse to maintain a, ver a varied number of organisations across associations, incorporated across um, volunteer-based organisations was critical. And perhaps the issue on which our own members, and I think the not-for-profit sector more broadly, has been most unanimous in its advocacy was that the Commission should be located independently from the Australian Tax Office. This came again out of the 2001 Charity Definition Inquiry. It comes from a history of pretty fraught relationships between the not-for-profit sector and the ATO. It comes from the ATO's own recognition that it is not and was never set up to be the regulator for charities and not-for-profits, but by virtue of its role administering tax concessions, that it plays a very important role in the sector. So, a um, long history of to the advocacy to ensure an independent body and, um, and particularly a recognition that the ATO was never intended to be the place and should not be the place where the regulation of charities and not-for-profit sector organisations happens. So I guess the question is why is this context important? It's important because it sets the tone for the advocacy that community organisations, charities and not-for-profits have engaged in over the past two years <coughs> since the government's commitments were made. But it also allows us to understand how the advocacy of the sector and the policy direction by government have, um, have sometimes intersected but have sometimes contradicted each other. And that's a really critical issue when we come to understand what's happening currently in terms of the establishment of the Charities Commission, in terms of the idea to modernise the definition of charity, and in terms of the issues that community organisations continue to raise as problems with the current policy, definition, uh, policy directions. I think perhaps the most confusing issue for members of the sector has been the conflation of the tax reform agenda and the regulatory directions that were announced in those commitments in 2011. So the conflation of the establishment of the Charities Commission, the idea about modernising the definition of charity and what, that, what value that will hold to the sector, with reforms around the targeting of tax concessions, the Australia test, the Adelaide Business Income test. <coughs> That's a conflation that the charity and not-for-profit sector never sought. It's a conflation that wasn't within our sights in terms of the objectives that we were, we were seeking to achieve through these reforms and in terms of the directions that we thought government policy should take. But if we go back to those commitments by the Commonwealth Government in 2011, it's a direction that's very clear 
on the framing of those reforms, that the regulatory and the tax reforms were always seen by the government as part of the same parcel, were always part of the direction that the, that the policy steer would take. And so I think that's particularly important to bear in mind when we come to discussion about where the ACNC is up to now and what are the issues that the sector is having to deal with as part of that reform. So bringing us up to where we're up to with the ACNC today, an exposure draft of the legislation to establish the Charities Commission was released by Treasury in late 2011. It was made available publicly with around four to six weeks for um, responses from the sector, um, notably across Christmas, which is either a period of time off, um, end of year recovery, or certainly for many ACOS members, the peak period of time in terms of demand on charities, in terms of families needing to do it incredibly tough. Very hard for the sector to get to grips with these issues and make informed policy recommendations about them. From our own perspective, at the time of the exposure draft, we had three key concerns with the legislation that was being proposed to set up the National Regulator. The first was an overreaching scope in the legislation, moving well beyond what we regarded as relevant and appropriate principles of regulation into a whole range of areas that we had not realised were up for, for discussion within this reform and had not had the opportunity to do the kind of policy development and engagement across the sector that we need to be able to inform those directions. There was a lack of clarity in the bill around the independence of both the Commission and the Commissioner. Key issues, particularly because Cabinet had decided when it agreed to establish this Charities Commission to locate it with some shared back office function with the ATO. Now, we regard that as an unfortunate decision, but it was a decision made by Cabinet. It has never been up for discussion since. Notwithstanding that there will be some shared back office function with the ATO, there are clearly mechanisms and safeguards that are available to ensure the Commission's independence and the independence of the Commissioner and her staff in the operations that they undertake. But none of those safeguards were clear from the exposure draft that was first released last year. And then finally, we were incredibly concerned by what we regarded as a prescriptive tenor in terms of the government's arrangements that were proposed. The government's arrangements are one of the most significant elements for not-for-profits because it's on the basis of meeting those arrangements or, in fact, failing to comply with those arrangements that a whole range of the more pointy-end um, elements of the Commission's regulation kick in. So getting those government's arrangements right, making sure that they reflect the nature, the diversity, the activities of this sector, is absolutely critical to making sure that it's a Commission that works with and has the support of the sector and is able to function in terms of its, its own appropriate regulation. Since that exposure draft, there was um, quite a wealth of submissions made. There were some fairly unanimous points, particularly around those three key issues that were raised by community organisations, and it was clear that there was a long way to go in terms of getting the legislation to a point where it had the agreement of the sector, but also to a point where the interests that government was um, clearly pursuing within that legislation were understood and aligned with the kind of work that the subject felt it was able to do. What that's meant in practice is that consultation since the exposure draft has been fairly limited to processes by invitation only, referred to as targeted consultation, but really focused on some very particular um, processes already underway in terms of communication with the government. Um, so, you know, by virtue of being involved in other processes, some organisations have been able to stay involved in that process to date. And certainly ACOS has been one of them but not with any capacity to relay the directions to our members or to the community sector more broadly, much less to the not-for-profit sector more broadly, not with any capacity to test drive the kinds of directions that are being proposed, to understand their impact on a broad, very diverse sector, and to make well-informed policy recommendations in response. So where does that bring us? The current status of the ACNC is that the bill is currently before the House of Representatives Economics Committee. And I think it's important to acknowledge some very successful advocacy by community and not-for-profit organisations has achieved a significant outcome in allowing there to be a second phase of exposure to the legislation that, has, that will establish the Charities Commission. 
it was incredibly important to ensure that this much broader sector be able to understand and engage with the legislation that will establish its, its first ever National Charities Regulator. The ACNC is scheduled to open its doors on the 1st of October this year. But in order to do so, the legislation that will enable it needs to be passed in the coming sitting periods of, of Federal Parliament. So that's several weeks in August and in September. So that brings us up to speed in terms of where the ACNC is up to now. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce to you Susan Pascoe, who many of you will know. Susan Pascoe is the Interim Commissioner for the ACNC and will take up the mantle when it opens its doors. Susan has worked tirelessly with her team to, um, to ensure that the implementation of the ACNC is done in a way that is incredibly acknowledging of the work that the sector has already done towards this and engages with the sector around its, both its implementation and its establishment once up and running. The ACNC Implementation Task Force has at all times recognised the importance of its independence and has managed a very difficult and sometimes very fraught process of, um, on the one hand, being driven by a government policy process, but on the other hand, recognising the role and the value of an independent regulator. I think it's important to recognise before Susan joins us that it's not Susan's team that have made the policy decisions or led the directions that I've referred to in the reform so far. And what I'd like to do is invite Susan to talk to you about what the ACNC means for organisations once it opens doors, give you a bit of a sense of what the expectations will be on the sector and where we think the ACNC will be heading, and then come back to the question about the legislation that's currently before Parliament, what it means for the sector and what we think might be some of the next steps in terms of advocacy and, and um, directions for not-for-profit organisations. and General Counsel for the Australian Charities and not profits Commission. And would be known to many of you um, if you've uh, worked uh, in and around the, the legal matters associated with uh, charities uh, as his uh, former partner in Law's Legal. Now, uh, the presentation I'm going to do today uh, is very much drawn from the uh, request from Tessa as to where the issues were for people uh, so it's an attempt in, in anticipation, if you like, of the, the issues that you might have to answer them for you. But of course, uh, the, uh, we'll be here and uh, very happy to answer any queries you've got or to hear any comments uh, that you've got. And including throughout, by the way, if this is matters aren't clear. Now, uh, I'll begin with a, a quote from uh, an address that David Bradbury, the Assistant Treasurer, gave on the 17th of May, where um, he announced that the uh, passage of the legislation would happen in, in this way, that is that the governance standards and the financial reporting would be withdrawn from the bill as it was then and subject to further consultation. Uh, so that the bill that's going forward, as Tessa mentioned, is with the House of Reps Economics uh, Committee at the moment, um, is the bill that will establish uh, the ACNC uh, and including the, the scope of its powers. But in particular, given that one of the key functions is registration, enable it um, when it opens its doors to begin that function. Um, so the, the intention of the government is that the uh, ACNC will still open its doors on the 1st of October. Some of you would know that that's already um, three months later than was originally intended. It was intended to be the 1st of July. But in early March, the government announced that there would be an additional three months consultation on the bill as it was then. So you can see uh, we've now got a second phase of consultation on the um, outstanding contentious elements in the bill. What it means, of course, is that um, the, those elements, such as the governance standards, which will be the subject of further consultation coordinated by Treasury, 
but the financial reporting, uh, the ATNC task force uh, will be very actively involved in uh, working with the sector to try and get um, strong uh, financial reporting requirements in place, uh, bearing in mind the commitment to red tape reduction. So what has happened to the timeline um, as a result of the um, 17th of May announcement is that it's expected still that on the, the 1st of October that the ACNC uh, will be ready to open its doors. Um, by uh, around, if you look across the timeline, the um, 1st of July 2013, you've got two boxes on either side of that date. The financial reporting and the governance regulations would come into effect as well as the new statutory definition of charity. I'm going to come back to that, but in effect what it means is that um, for the first year of reporting, there will be no financial reporting. There will be a modified annual information statement, which is a two-page report um, that all charities would provide. Uh, and only after that, for the reporting period that begins the 1st of July 2014, but includes period from the 1st of July 2013, then for the medium and larger charities, the financial reporting requirements would come into play. It is, I'll say in parentheses, worth noting that the, for those of you who've had a chance to look at the bill, um, it has medium, so, so small, medium and large charities defined, small under 20, 250,000, um, and, and medium up to a million and large, a million and beyond. Um, that has been the subject of quite a bit of discussion in the consultations that we've had. Uh, so it will be interesting to see whether there's pressure to modify, uh, and most of the discussion is that they want to be uh, adjusted upwards, those levels, uh, whether there's pressure to adjust them. Uh, we shall see. That's part of the, the process of having it before the House of Reps um, Economics Committee. And of course, if you see under the line on July the 1st, 2013, um, there is six months to get your re first report in. Um, and that, so that will take you to the 31st of December. Um, so th there's a fair amount of uh, leeway, if you like, uh, to get your reporting done. And as I mentioned, it's not till the 1st of July, 2014, that the, for the medium and large charities, that their reports are due. But I will return to these matters because I know it's a bit complex. So I'm going to just quickly uh, mention some of the key concepts and then come back to the questions um, that I was asked to address. The idea of the one-stop shop is that um, for different groups, uh, it will have a, a different impact. For the public, it means for the first time that they can go to one spot uh, and they can get information on charities and learn about the sector. Now, if they want to learn about a charity, they've got to go to a host of different websites um, to get that information. So that um, would be one, I think, for the public, dramatic and significant red tape reduction. Uh, we often think of red tape reduction in relation to government and those enterprises that deal with dark government, but the public, it's also quite important. For the funders and donors, there will be baseline information on the um, financial and governance arrangements of charities, and so that will all be consolidated in a single spot. But the charities themselves, rather than have to go to four different sites, um, they can apply for registration. Uh, they can apply through this portal to get their Australian business number. We would just link them to the Australian Business Register. They can apply for their Commonwealth tax concessions and we would link them straight to the Australian Taxation Office. Um, and there's the potential for a number of other uh, linkages that we can make. So, for example, if the states and territories agree to be part of this and then discussions are well underway, um, then they, we can also pass on that charity to the relevant state revenue office and they can apply um, any concessions, state-based or territory-based concessions for which the entity would be eligible. So you can see that there's, um, uh, if you like, a, a, a single point of reference that ought to make it a lot easier for charities. And so when we start to think about it in terms of red tape reduction, these are some of the measures um, that would assist. Reporting, as we know, is a significant other measure. 
with the report one's use often, there's really three elements to think about there. And by the way, we're very happy to provide this um, electronically uh, if people want copies. The idea of a charity passport is largely within government, but um, what it means is that the information that you provide at the point of registration or through your annual information statement, which is really just an update largely on um, your activities or any changes to key personnel, um, we would use that to uh, group together the core information that government uses when it liaises with, with any enterprises really, but we're talking about charities and, and not-for-profits. Uh, there's been an exercise across the Commonwealth where the departments have been asked, if you're funding an agency either through a grant or through a service agreement, what's the core information that you, you pretty much always ask for? And it comes down to about 15 items. That can be electronically corralled, um, and then once we have it, uh, we can provide it instantaneously to any government department. And once we have it, they are not supposed or allowed to ask you again for it. We've got it. All they do is, is, is um, give us your ABN or your, um, your legal name and we, we transfer it across. The technology, technology exists that they can identify or for, develop forms that mean that when that information is passed across, it can populate their forms automatically. So the technology is there to make all of this happen very smoothly so that you don't constantly have to provide the same information to government, including the government's arrangements, which you'll give us at the point of registration. They'll be there. So uh, when you deal with government, you just give your ABN or you just give your legal name and that's it. So that is, for those of you who do uh, a lot of grant making or involved in a lot of service agreements, that was also ought to be a significant um, reduction in the administration of the red tape. With the annual information statement, the intention there is that, uh, particularly once we've got your registration details verified, that that will keep the site up to date so that when people visit the site, um, they, they know, uh, that they're confident that it's accurate information. And I think for the ACNC, um, the fact for the credibility of the site um, that once it's a registered charity, it's a charity that the public and donors and yourselves can be confident that the data is verified. Um, and so, and it's up to date, and so that's quite important. So you'll note in the Act that there are requirements that you keep up to date uh, for the larger charities within 28 days of a change of um, you know, your, your, your governors or um, or, uh, or for the smaller charities within 60 days, that kind of thing. If there were a change to your, you know, a significant change to your activities that you kept up to date and so on. And for the financial reports, as I mentioned, that's for the medium and large charities, um, and that'll differ uh, from charity type to charity type. And what I mean by that, when I said that the government in the minister on the 17th of May when he gave the additional time. We're using that time to work with the Commonwealth departments and go through um, and identify if you're a school or a hospital or an employment provider or an aged care provider, what do you currently provide to government? What's asked for from the um, ACNC? Where's the duplication? How can we rationalise? Uh, and we want to take it a step further but also be saying is the information that you're requiring absolutely necessary? How do you use it? So that's the, that's the uh, opportunity that we get for red tape reduction. And we know it's government policy, um, but we also know that um, there's a long history of, uh, of creep in this area. No, so go back, go back to the question. So what do you need to know or do on, on the 1st of October? And the, the reality is if you are an existing uh, charity that's um, registered with the ATO, the short answer is nothing really, unless you're a religious uh, body. So if you want to opt out, um, then there's a means of doing it, and uh, I won't read through all of that, but you can see um, that, that it's, it's a pretty easy process, you fill out a form. You might decide, look, with this ACNC, look, I'm just not interested in being a registered charity, um, I'm going to operate in, in a different way. As you can see from the last phrase there, you wouldn't lose access to your tax concessions if you did that, so um, I suspect not too many will, but still, some will. Uh, religious institutions um, which are self-assessing um, as income tax exempt, um, they will need to notify us, uh, and again, they'll, they'll have 12 months to do so. 
So uh, they're the, the two steps that would need to be taken, bearing in mind that it's not until the statutory definition of charity is activated on the 1st of July 2013 that we can begin to then look again at those existing charities that the ATO has recognised and assess their ongoing charitable status. Um, it's not expected that um, there be much change at all. The change that's expected to come from that would be if there's um, a charity that's actually moribund, and, and this has happened with other charity regulators, in fact there are people on the list that have ceased to operate, or there's an enterprise that's still designated as a charity but in fact has changed its purposes so dramatically that in effect it wouldn't satisfy charitable purposes any longer. But they're typically the two reasons. So communicating um, with the ACNC at that point, um, and, and this is an, an in an ongoing way, um, if you have changes such as you change your name or address or office bearers, or you want to change your governing rules, um, you need to notify us or else you wouldn't be compliant with the Act. So that, that would be in an ongoing way. And that's similar for any of you who are companies limited by guarantee to your um, requirements with ASIC. So what do you need to know and do on the 1st of July 2013? Um, and uh, you know, we had a glimpse of that when we looked at the uh, timeline. Um, so from then you'll need to be providing the annual information statement, but you do get to the 31st of December um, before it's due. You will note that there is also uh, the ability for people to have a substituted accounting period. And we know, we know that there's whole classes of charities like schools that operate on a calendar year and so they would um, simply request a different accounting period and then their reports would be six months after, if you're a school, it would be six months after the 31st of December. And from the, for the medium and large um, registered charities, as I mentioned, your reports would be due um, by the, well in fact by the 31st of December before the reporting period, the 1st of July um, 2014. And again, unless you have a substituted accounting period. Okay, this is um, what our website is going to be uh, in the future from the 1st of July 2013. Uh, and uh, this is a mock-up of what it's likely to look like. Um, but I hope you can see the intention is to have it as, as interactive as possible, um, to have information for the public, uh, and those who are interested in how to find a charity. For new charities, and that will take you through what you need to do um, to go through the registration process. For existing charities, particularly uh, what you need to do uh, now, and that will be very important, we think, for the 1st of October, particularly because then we know there's some nervousness from people who think they should be doing something um, and they're not. And it's, it's, in some ways, it's a strange message to be told you don't need to do anything. It seems counterintuitive. Um, but uh, that's where they sit at the moment. And so on, publications about the ACNC and so on. And we'll keep a live um, count of the number of charities. The ATO has 56,000 on its books um, that you see in the left hand corner there. That's actually the number from the New Zealand Charity Commission. Uh, but, but we would keep a pretty live count. What's interesting when you look at charity commissions um, in English speaking countries, uh, Almost all of them have roughly the same number register as a voluntarily deregister each year. So in Australia, it's, it varies between four and six thousand each year register and, and deregister. So I think once we've uh, cleared those that are no longer operational from that fifty-six thousand that will be handed on the first of October, uh, then we expect it to remain a pretty static number. So when you're registering, um, it's, it's a dynamic online form. That's not just a bit of um, you know, uh, advertising speak. It means that it's actually interactive. It will have information buttons that you can press. It will also be one of those frustrating forms that if you haven't filled in the, the section that you've just left, it will tell you to go back and do it properly um, before you go into the next section and so on. Um, so that we can get the information to assess your eligibility to be registered. Um, we can display the information on the public portal and we have the information that the tax office needs to uh, apply the tax concessions. Um, so from the 1st of October, on our register, so this, this year, we'll simply have for each charity its name, its ABN, 
the state in which it's uh, registered and the link to the Australian Business Register and there's a little bit, as you know, a little bit more information there. We are unable to provide any more information than that until we can verify the information. And even though some of you would have got a, you should have all in fact got a letter from the tax office asking if you want to update your information, um, it's not really the uh, ACNC's information. We will receive much of that from the tax office, but from the 1st of July next year we'll begin the process of verification. So the register itself, it will look something like this where um, a member of the public can go in, put in either an ABN if they know it or the business name um, and then search. Over time, when there's enough information, uh, and we're talking probably 2015, uh, then you'll be able to make comparative searches. You would appreciate if we're not going to get, uh, be in a position to begin reassessing charitable status until the 1st of July next year, and there's 56,000, that's going to be quite a time-consuming exercise. So we don't imagine um, that that's going to be done uh, within 12 months. We think it'll take longer. In the meantime, of course, we'll be getting the annual information statements in. So we'll be getting uh, information that the charities have um, uh, themselves put forward as, as valid and true, and that will be giving us information to start putting on the, the portal. Uh, so. It, it, it'll, it'll take time to build, but I, I think most people would understand that. <laughs> so, um, from the 1st of October 2013, 12 months after the starting date, there will be additional information such as contact details, the charitable purposes, and so on. You can read them for yourselves. Um, but you can see that uh, when I refer back to the government holding information about you and not needing to ask again, I think you can see uh, the information that government is often asking from you, um, such as your governing rules, uh, it'll all be there uh, on the website and including from 2014 um, your financial reports. Now, you may want to put other information on. Um, if, a, if a charity wants to load up a PDF of their latest annual information, uh, sorry, annual report, they're, they're welcome um, to do so. Uh, I don't think we can become the uh, the full kind of advertising uh, portal for charities, but if charities want to um, actively promote their, their charitable activity, uh, you know, within the limits of the site, um, that's uh, very welcomed. Um, so activities and beneficiaries, uh, all locations of operations, annual reports, data about the charity individually and collectively and so on. We, we imagine that this will be a particular benefit to the smaller charities that don't really have the facility to, to manage their own sites and they will be able to refer people um, to this site. Now in terms of the approach to education guidance and compliance, the, we see them very much interrelated as a, a part of a, a regulatory approach. So there is the legislation, many of you will have had the chance um, to read it, um, all 260 pages, I think, of the explanatory memorandum as, as well as the bill. Um, but you would see that there are um, some significant powers within the bill. If you look at the way that charity regulators in other places operate, and certainly the way that we are committed to operate, they're very rarely used. They're there for those extreme cases um, of deliberate wrongdoing, which can happen. Uh, in any human enterprise really, so we're talking cases of fraud, of money laundering um, or indeed um, the use of a charity to finance um, terrorist activity. It's those kind of very serious activities for which the powers are there. Um, the way that the uh, ACNC intends to operate is to provide sufficient information and advice um, that charities understand what's required it's also intended to keep it to a minimum, to only ask for information that really is needed and also to feedback as, as much as we can, um, to put that information on the register and you'll see in the Act that one of the requirements, apart from registering, is to maintain the register so that it's there, it's up to date uh, for people uh, who want to uh, obtain that information. It's just this important part of our role to assist charities to meet their obligations um, but, of course, if there are serious breaches, um, to investigate those. We do anticipate if we have a similar start to other charity regulators, that there might be a flurry of complaints, um, that there, would, there will be some who are holding um, existing concerns that they have. 
for the regulator. We don't intend to get into um, dispute resolution that relates to um, you know, personality differences between members of governing boards or all that kind of thing. But if there are um, serious allegations, then yes, we will pursue them. And of course, you would see that one of the, uh, the ob objects of the Act is to maintain, protect and enhance public trust and confidence in the sector. So the guidance is intended to be in pra plain, practical language. Um, there's uh, an advice services, uh, there's a phone advisory service which will operate from 8am to 8pm um, or you can email. When you approach us you will get a name um, and, you'll, and uh, when you uh, phone in or email in you will know who you can respond to. You can go back to that person. So the intention is to keep it um, as personal as possible because we are conscious that many of the people will be dealing with are volunteers that there is a fairly high rate of turnover of volunteers um, and that it's important that people uh, know that they can go to you know, Freddie Smith or whoever it might be for the advice and that Freddie Smith knows a little bit about them. So the education and guidance, um, this is giving you a bit of an idea of what the website uh, will look like. Um, starting and registering a charity. Is your organisation a charity? Not even, you know, like it's, it's interesting, people in the not-for-profit sector are not always clear about whether it's a charity and therefore whether it needs to be um, uh, taking close attention to these um, initiatives at this stage. Um, the ACNC's role, what the reporting obligations are, and then how to up update your organisation's details. So it's um, you know, trying to be, uh, I suppose, as, as clear and helpful as possible. Now just looking at the regulatory approach, and I'm really done here, um, the intention that we have is to keep it as light touch as possible, risk-based, um, and we know that charities are in fact quite a low risk, uh, bearing in mind that very rare opportunity, uh, example of, of those that misuse charities, uh, and to use it as, as evidence-based. The intention is to have timely, accessible information guidance and education and that's one of the reasons that we're going to be using the website a lot. We've even got ourselves a Twitter account which for those of my generation uh, is a fairly new initiative um, and we're about to update the YouTube channel um, which we haven't refreshed for a while but we're trying to use as many modalities as possible so that people who are working in the sector who are time poor um, can uh, log on when it suits them. I think the next dot point is very important in terms of the regulatory approach. If you look at the Act, there are graduated powers. There are uh, a host of formal means that can be used from um, the issuing of, of, of the requiring of information, the issuing of warnings, and so on, um, and the uh, opportunity for self correction. Prior to that, we would have every intention of sending out reminders and alerts uh, and keeping people informed. Um, and no one uh, is interested in uh, smacking charities because they you know, didn't get their form in on time or whatever. Um, so we don't uh, have any intention of operating in that legal, uh, legalistic frame. Uh, we have every intention of working with and assisting the sector. I think there's quite an interesting parallel in the work of the Office of the Register of Indigenous Corporations, ORIC, and some of you might be familiar with its activities, but they have a 92% return rate, uh, you know, on time, uh, you know, accurately uh, filled for their annual returns. Uh, but they provide a very high rate of support and guidance and advice uh, to the sector, which is largely uh, Indigenous corporations. Our regulatory principles are a fairly common set, uh, but, you know, and again, we, we intend, as you can see, to go out and consult on these, but Relevance, we have to ask for information that's relevant, that's proportionate, very important, consistent, transparent and timely. And we, once the legislation is through, we intend to consult uh, with the sector on uh, other aspects of the regulatory approach. We've developed a regulatory pyramid, which is pretty common in this area, and we intend to go out and, and um, consult on that and the other aspects of the way we interact with the sector. And there's the pyramid. Um, notice it's got education and support at the bottom. Some people have suggested that we um, <coughs> invert the pyramid because most of your activity, in fact, um, is happening at the bottom level, education and support. I think it depends on whether you read up or you read down whether you see uh, that this is the right way. Um, 
but it starts with that, the assisted compliance, which is letters, phone calls, site visits and so on. Then the proactive, which is the more formal um, investigation, responding to complaints, um, using the powers that we need to collect information. Then the graduated and proportionate sanctions, so that would be warnings and so on. And then uh, there is power to suspend or remove trustees, except from what are called basic charitable, uh, sorry, religious institutions, um, and of course the power to deregister. Uh, if you look at the use of these powers in other places, as I said, very sparingly used. Mind you, apart from New Zealand, where the only power they have is to re deregister. And uh, in the, apparently for the charities, it's a ho hum, I've been deregistered, I'll just go and get myself re registered. Um, but the, the way that the uh, ACNC bill has been enacted, there's a lot more um, uh, powers in there so that you can have a graduated approach. So um, this is just one of the issues that people wanted to hear about. What's the difference between the one-stop shop reports um, and the information on the portal? Um, and there's a degree to which um, the, the, they significantly overlap. Uh, the commissioner is to uh, maintain the, the Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission register. Um, I'm still getting used to that acronym, but anyway, that's how it is. Uh, and so section um, 40, um, five in the Act de details the information to be provided publicly. So if you're interested, um, the, the Act's available and you can see most of it I've given you in the slides today, but that's the, the kind of information that will be there on the portal. Uh, but the Commissioner does have the power to withhold or remove information from the Register in certain circumstances and charities can request this. So for example, um, this is the example that's often given, if you're a women's refuge um, and even putting your name or your address um, could put the, the health and safety of, of some of your um, clients at risk, then uh, you've got a very strong case for not having any information on the register. Um, so um, the Act um, asks the Commissioner to balance the public interest um, and of course part of the public interest in the Act is, is, is the promotion of transparency and accountability um, with other relevant factors. And that's it um, from me. That was an attempt really to rock through and give you the, the key issues of interest. Thank you very much, Susan. I'm um, very grateful to you for the time that you've made to participate, not just in this briefing, but in a whole range of opportunities like this for the sector to come together and hear what's happening and understand better what the implications are for sector organisations and really come to grips with the rest of the reforms that are before us. So um, thank you for joining us today and for that ongoing role that you've really prioritised and emphasised in your work. So what I wanted to do was to give you a flavour of the, the opportunities and the directions that the ACNC itself is taking, which certainly from our reading are incredibly exciting and are the kinds of things that we absolutely want to see available for the not-for-profit sector nationally. But I do now want to return to the legislation, which is where I, I paused on before Susan um, gave us her presentation, because that's the, that's the um, part of the policy reform work that is most um, present and most current, and is really the issue that, from, from an ACOS perspective, is where we need to come back to the sector and really take a bit of a pulse and um, do some of this work around, around engagement with our own members and colleagues in the sector. We find ourselves in a pretty difficult position where on the one hand this is a reform that we have long championed. This is the, the work of the Implementation Task Force, the work of the Commission is work that we would very much like to welcome. And on the other hand, we need to be confident that the legislation that underpins that has the kinds of mechanisms but also the kinds of safeguards that the sector can rely upon no matter who's at the helm, and that's both at the helm of the ACNC, but also at the helm of government in terms of the kinds of policy changes that might affect sector capacity and sector liability. And so when we think about the legislation from that perspective, there are some issues that we continue to have some concerns about, but there's also quite a gulf between the knowledge and the understanding of the contents of the legislation for that very small number of organisations which, as you'll remember I said, have been able to stay involved in the policy development process until now, and the much broader sector for whom all of this is something that organisations have been aware of, but not necessarily something 
that, um, across, that they're across the detail for. So um, in terms of the legislation as it currently stands, many organisations have made submissions to the House of Representatives Economics Committee. Those submissions were due last Friday and we understand that there will be hearings or some form of process of engagement with the committee in fact this week. Um, the committee is obviously going through those submissions almost as quickly as the sector had to write them, um, so stand by for where that gets to. The House of Representatives Economics Committee is a standing committee. Um, its submissions should be available on the website, and ANCOS has made a submission, as, as I say, along with many other organisations. So um, keep an eye out for those if you'd like to get to the detail of um, the sorts of issues that people are raising. But the sorts of issues that people are raising and how we resolve those from a policy perspective and in terms of enabling the ACNC to be up and running are not easy questions and the answers are not clear. And so some of the issues that, for example, I flagged here are partly to do with this gulf of understanding that we are expecting between what the ACNC can do, what it has said it wants to do, and what the sector wanted it to do in 2010 and in the years before in terms of the advocacy that got us to this point. So some of the issues on this list, for instance, the independence of the ACNC, are issues that have had a huge amount of work, particularly over the last eight months, particularly, as I say, by Susan and her team, but are not issues that are necessarily clear from a reading of the legislation. So the, the sector needs to have confidence in the processes that are going to be embedded in the establishment of this commission without necessarily being able to turn to the provision of the bill where those are set out. I think the question about the reduction of red tape, the um, reform framework in which this reform um, was introduced was very much one about the reduction of red tape. It's a reform agenda that the government has been running with the business community. It's a reform agenda that not-for-profits have been very strongly advocating within our own sector. And yet um, the capacity for the reduction of red tape requires a whole lot of steps that are not necessarily in the control either of the federal government at the moment or of the Charities Commission itself. And the clearest example there is the um, capacity and the, the willingness of state and territory regulators to refer powers to the ACNC to make it a truly national body. Now we know very well that both the government and the ACNC itself have been working with states and territories around those processes. Those are absolutely in train. But again, there isn't a provision within the legislation that you can necessarily turn to to be confident about that. And so making sure that this commission continues to have that role serve that function and take that direction into the future is something that we would like to see within the legislation. I think the third point relates to the language that, you, that is used in the legislation. One of our recommendations is that we use some of the language that the sector itself is most comfortable with, for instance governing bodies, rather than a, a much more legal term like entities that actually applies to all sorts of different positions at all, all different times in the bill. So making sure that this is legislation that the sector is able to understand, feels comfortable with, are all really important parts of ensuring the sector's engagement with the Commission. And of course, a sector that's engaged with its own regulator is a sector that will be far better regulated. So the, the bottom line is making sure that this is a process and a reform that achieves the outcomes that it's intended to. Um, definition of charity will come back to um, after morning tea, but I guess the, the key point to flag here is that the um, powers of the ACNC and indeed the other reforms that are underway in relation to the administration of tax concessions all flow from our understanding of what constitutes a charity. So we've had the establishment of the ACNC and we've had reforms underway in other areas that flow from a definition of charity that is yet to be reformed, that is yet to be modernised, assuming that that reform actually takes place. So there's a basic question about sequencing in terms of how these reforms have rolled out that has not made it easy for the charity and not-for-profit sector to be engaged with and understand the implications of each element of the reform process. So again, that's not an issue that's limited to the ACNC, but it's very relevant to what the ACNC will do, and it's particularly pertinent to organisations trying to understand what the implications will be of this new regulatory framework for their own organisations. <coughs> 
Um, governance standards are probably one of the areas that's been most controversial in the development of the legislation, and the upshot of that controversy has been that the governance standards have actually been removed from the legislation, um, which is all well and good in that it was they were removed with the intention of giving the sector greater capacity to be involved in the development of those standards and greater time for consultation and, and work towards them. But again, what it means is that we have a piece of legislation that is based on enforcing compliance and taking action in some cases where there's non-compliance with a set of standards that we don't yet have, with a set of expectations around the governance of charities and not-for-profit organisations that we're not yet clear on in terms of, in terms of what they will actually require of organisations. Our solution to that in the submissions we've made has been to require very clear consultation with the sector in the development of those government standards, but not surprisingly there's some unease across the sector about a reform that requires um, compliance with a, a regime or a set of arrangements on which we have no detail as yet. There's some other areas of the bill that raise concerns. There are a couple of exemptions that are flagged in the legislation, although not necessarily with a clear policy framework. And then there's a whole range of elements in terms of the actions that the ACNC can take that um, are certainly severe, and while there will undoubtedly be severe action required, the question is at what point? The question is what are the thresholds at which penalties may be enacted? What are the um, options and opportunities for the organisation in question to respond to and deal with the concerns before penalties are leveraged? And what are the implications of some of the procedures that the bill requires, particularly in terms of opportunity for appeal and for review of decision making? So those are the kinds of issues that we still have some concerns about in terms of the bill, and those are the sorts of issues that we've dealt with in our submission. Having said that, we absolutely want a national regulator. We absolutely want the capacity for the kind of work that Susan's talked about and the kinds of objectives that I flagged at the start of this presentation to be achieved through this reform. We see it as a once in a generation opportunity. I, I mentioned that some of this advocacy goes back at least until 2001 and policy development before it. We see the gathering of an excellent group of people in terms of the um, workforce of the ACNC and the workforce of the sector being able to work collaboratively over the directions that the ACNC might take. And we see a recognition within government as well as within um, regulators nationally to make improvements in the kinds of objectives around reduction of red tape and um, sector viability and effectiveness, but also transparency of this sector that we would like to be able to, um, to point to and to talk about. We expect high levels of good governance and accountability by other sectors, by business, by private sectors. We absolutely should be held accountable to those same standards ourselves. But the question is always how, and the question is always how to make sure that that happens with the full engagement and support of this sector, supporting its capacity, not undermining it.